Hey class, uh, so I guess this is how we're going to be doing the rest of the semester. So um, luckily, uh, we've already been somewhat practicing taking uh, or at least having these lectures online. So I guess the only adaptations that we're going to have to do are uh, quizzes, which uh, since they're going to be online, they won't be pop quizzes anymore, which that'll be okay. That'll be okay. And then having our different tests. Uh, uh, we have a few more of those in our final exam. All of those will be online. So um, I, I'll send out periodic reminders and everything. But here, let's go ahead and finish up exercise metabolism. So uh, last class that we had before our double week spring break, we had a pop quiz. So let's just go over that. Um, what is the rate limiting enzyme of the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle? So that is isocitrate dehydrogenase. And really the only other um, uh, main rate limiting enzymes that I wanted us to know would be creatine kinase and the phosphocreatine um, uh, pathway, which is just you know simply uh, ADP plus uh, phosphocreatine yields ATP and then a uh, free creatine and uh, uh, PFK, um, phosphofructokinase and glycolysis in the energy investment phase of it. Um, our second place where we actually lose an ATP there, so good on that. So number one right here, isocitrate dehydrogenase. Number two, what is the name of the transporter that gets longer chain fatty acids into a muscle cell? So. That one is fatty acid translocase, F-A-T, all capital. Or you could have written CD36, I would have taken that. Um, but typically it is notated as F-A-T slash CD36. But any of that would really um, uh, work for me. Um, just wanting you to know how things get into a muscle cell. Um, and that, that's really uh, like 16 carbons and above probably 14 carbons and above for a uh, fat. Uh, so the like 12 carbon lauric acid that I was talking about, that just freely gets in. Um, it just kind of simply diffuses across the cell membrane and um, we can use it relatively quickly. So uh, just uh, some kind of points on there how we're using all this. What is the name of the enzyme? responsible for converting a branch chain amino acid into Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle intermediates, BCAT, B-C-A-T, branch chain amino acid transferase. And really the, what's happening there is leucine, isoleucine, and valine, mostly isoleucine and valine are getting converted into uh, succinyl-CoA, um, which is, if you look at pictures of the Krebs cycle, it's around the bottom uh, right-hand corner of it. So that's where isoleucine and valine are going in. Um, leucine actually goes a couple of different places, but uh, that's a little bit beyond what I want you all to know. Uh, the next question, how many ATP would four NADH molecules likely yield in the electron transport chain? So remember one NAD, uh, or NADH, I'm sorry is equal to approximately 2.5 ATP. So four times 2.5, 10. That's really all I wanted there. Um, uh, <clears throat> so be able to do that for exams going forward. Uh, next, define beta oxidation. So this one, uh, I, I, I took a wide array of answers for this. Um, the main thing I wanted everyone to say is chopping off two carbons of fatty acid at a time to make acetyl-CoA because acetyl-CoA is only two carbons. Uh, however, um, just kind of the uh, breakdown of fat um, for fuel to make ATP eventually, I, I took things like that. But the, the main thing that I wanted everyone to know is breaking down two uh, carbons, we're cleaving off, chopping off two carbons from a longer chain fatty acid at a time in order to make acetyl-CoA. That's really the main stuff that I wanted. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get back to everything that we were talking about before. Uh, 
Um, we were talking about lactic acid. Remember, it's lactic acid whenever it's inside the muscle. It's called lactate whenever it's circulating in your blood. So we make um, uh, lactic acid in the muscle whenever, we're, uh, whenever we start reaching a particular exercise intensity. You can really kind of tell um, that you're producing a lot whenever you start huffing and puffing uh, quite a bit because we're trying to get like excess carbon dioxide out and uh, uh, like we'll, we'll make a fair bit of carbon dioxide whenever we're um, uh, ma making more lactic acid inside of a muscle. They, they kind of run together a bit. But after we make it, um, how do we get rid of it? And there's two things right here, and I know I already talked about this in the last lecture, just um, uh, trying to get us on, uh, on the same page since we've been apart for so long. Um, the classical theory, so the majority of lactic acid is converted to glucose in the liver, and that's through something called the Cori cycle, C-O-R-I, Cori cycle. And whenever we make glucose from something that isn't a carbohydrate or um, kind of glucose in nature, it's called gluconeogenesis. So I've talked about gluconeogenesis before in relation to making carbohydrates out of proteins, but whenever we convert um, uh, lactic acid into glucose, that's also called gluconeogenesis. Um, so just gluconeo new genesis creation, right? So creation of new glucose, that's all that that means. Um, uh, that was the majority of it, but it seems like that almost all of it, 70%, give or take, is actually oxidized, meaning that it is converted into pyruvate and then enters the Krebs cycle in different types of tissues. So say we make a lot of glucose, um, not glucose, I'm sorry, lactic acid in skeletal muscle, then we export it out of a muscle cell into your uh, uh, bloodstream, it goes to the heart or the brain, the brain seems to be pretty good at this, um, <clears throat> and it is converted into pyruvate and then subsequently acetyl-CoA and then we go through the Krebs cycle with it and make uh, ATP through the electron transport chain. So that seems to be the majority of it. Uh, only about 20% is actually um, gluconeogenesis, like the Cori cycle, like we were talking about. And then 10% or so is converted into amino acids, which uh, that one, the reason I don't have that underlined is, uh, truthfully, I, like, I want to see more evidence of that even being a thing, so I would only test you on uh, the majority is oxidized a little bit is converted into glucose. Now, lactic acid can be removed rapidly with light exercise. So this is part of the reason why we could do a cool down. Um, and if we're exercising at uh, what would be a very light intensity, 30 to 40 percent of someone's VO2 max, that seems to rapidly clear lactate or lactic acid because it's in the muscle uh, a, a little bit more quickly. Um, so that would be one of the main reasons why we actually would do a cool down. Now there's a couple of things uh, with that that I'm going to talk about in a slide or two. But here's just a pictorial representation of uh, how lactic acid essentially uh, starts accruing from exercise. So whenever we're at lower intensities of exercise, hopefully, like I have my cursor on here, we don't have a lot going on uh, right here at fairly low intensities, but then we reach a point where we start making a lot of lactate, like we can measure in the blood. We did that in lab, um, and that is called the lactate inflection point, or yeah, we can also call it the lactate threshold, anaerobic threshold, onset of blood lactate accumulation. The main numbers here that we want to know are four millimoles per liter. So essentially once we're at four, then we're getting into overloading the energy generation phase of glycolysis. Um, not enough oxygen to get pyruvate uh, into the mitochondria. So. What's going on here, more or less? This is basically what's happening. So whenever we go through glycolysis, we end up with pyruvate. Then uh, we essentially have uh, 
so much NADH, you know, that's in its um, uh, a reduced form right there, NADH. And we need um, these NADHs to keep on going in the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate uh, dehydrogenase reaction and the energy generation phase. I'm going to show you that here in a second. But here, we essentially donate those hydrogens here. And there's more hydrogens in lactate, so this is actually making us slightly less acidic. It's, uh, so whenever we're feeling that burning sensation from exercise, it has nothing to do with lactate. It's, uh, lactate is actually reducing the acidity. We're feeling all of these hydrogen ions. And this lactate dehydrogenase reaction is effectively just going this uh, direction in muscles whenever we are exercising very hard. Now, once lactate is in the uh, bloodstream, then it can go to, say, heart tissue. And this reaction can actually reverse and go the other way. So that's because lactate dehydrogenase, there's there's effectively four subunits to it. You don't need to know this um, for this class, but I think it's interesting. There's four different subunits. There's kind of a more skeletal muscle type, and there's a more like heart type. And overall, the heart type will make this reaction more likely to go from lactate to pyruvate, whereas the skeletal muscle type will make it more likely to go from pyruvate to lactate. So. Uh, I, I don't know, like I think that's um, fairly interesting, just like how I think that hydrogen ion is interesting, but I already talked about how lactate is reducing the acidity. But right here, um, this is effectively why we do that, um, uh, why the uh, NADHs go down and donate that hydrogen ion to lactic acid, or uh, to the lactate uh, uh, dehydrogenase enzyme, because we only have a finite amount of these NADs within the cytosol or um, uh, like just not in the mitochondria of skeletal muscle. So if we don't have enough of these, then this will get a backlog right here and we cannot convert glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And that's somewhat of a problem because then we can't generate these four ATP down here, right? So if we effectively need energy right now because we're exercise, like we're doing a 400 meter dash, we don't have enough time to actually get pyruvate into the mitochondria because we have a relative, like, uh, relatively speaking, an immediate need for energy. So we. <clears throat> we'll just like take these NADHs, donate that hydrogen down here to convert pyruvate into lactate, and then we'll have more free NADs so that we can go through this aspect of this bioenergetic pathway and then actually get these ATP right here so that we can, you know, like meet energy demands of a cell. Hopefully that makes sense. Effectively, the main thing, we only have a finite amount of these. So if they're all in the form of NADH, um, then we can't keep on going with this energy like generation phase of glycolysis. So we need to get rid of those quickly and we can throw them into lactate dehydrogenase fairly fast so that we can generate these ATP rate right here. All right, moving on just a little bit. So here, just kind of a basic point. So the whole reason for the buildup of lactic acid within the muscle, but lactate in the blood, we, our need for ATP is greater than pyruvate can be transported into the mitochondria. So that's kind of what's going on here. Now, blood lactate removal following strenuous exercise. If we exercise super ultra hardcore, like the wind gates that we, we did in lab, um, 30 seconds of just crushing it, or, you know, 400 meter dash, 800 meter dash, whatever. Um, how can we get lactate back down to baseline sooner? Um, and that is just simply through light exercise. So light pedaling on a bike, um, walking a lap or two uh, uh, somewhat um, quickly, or, well, I mean, at a low pace, 
Uh, and if you just do that for approximately around five, 10 minutes, it will get us back to baseline levels of lactate, which is about one millimole, really soon. Now, if we don't do any exercise, our blood lactate is back down to baseline within an hour, typically. So my question is, what is the application here? And uh, uh, the primary application would be if you have more than one bout in a day um, that we need to uh, get through. Um, sorry, here, let me get my thoughts straight. Um, if we have more than one exercise session or competition within a day, we probably need to do a bit of a cool down in order to get our blood lactate back to baseline so that we have more room to effectively make more lactate whenever we start exercise or um, uh, competition again. Now, if we don't have more than one, uh, like exercise session or uh, competition within a day, it probably isn't that necessary. So, uh, all right, moving on from there. There's a couple of things um, and for summary that, uh, just go and read through that. I think it's fairly interesting. Um, uh, EPOC is kind of one of the main things that we're talking about there. All right, now going back just a little bit, metabolic responses to short-term intense exercise and then long-term exercise here in a bit. So typically, how we want to see this are two different uh, types of energy generation. So we have anaerobic and aerobic. And there's effectively a push and pull between those. So the more intense the exercise, the more anaerobic. The, um, the well, more intense, shorter duration, the more anaerobic. The less intense, longer duration, the more aerobic. And that just means uh, without oxygen, anaerobic, with oxygen, aerobic. And our primary energy systems for anaerobic are ATP, PC system, and glycolysis. Um, also, that myokinase is having uh, quite a bit to do, but uh, for purposes here, I'm not going to bring that up. Um, so here, here's how this goes effectively. Uh, first one to five seconds. This is basically almost entirely the phosphocreatine system. And once it starts lasting longer than five seconds, then we have a shift to glycolysis. And in particular, like anaerobic glycolysis, meaning that we are producing lactate instead of pyruvate. So we're not having enough time to actually get pyruvate into the Krebs cycle. Now, once things start lasting longer than 45 seconds, then uh, there is a mixture of all uh, three of the systems. So the aerobic system uh, starts doing a little bit. So about uh, F for 60 seconds, it's about 70-30, give or take. And for around two minutes, it's about 50-50. Um, and Keep in mind there, the anaerobic systems, we're really just talking about uh, phosphocreatine and glycolysis. All right, so next for prolonged exercise, so essentially anything longer than 10 minutes, and if it's a low enough intensity, anything longer than approximately two and a half, three minutes, we will start using primarily the aerobic system. And, uh, uh, particularly if it is at a steady state, meaning that you're uh, running, cycling, walking, what, uh, climbing, whatever you're doing, uh, rowing, at a submaximal pace that you can maintain. Um, so like a steady, non-changing pace. So I'm not talking about like a fartlek run where you sprint for a little bit and then walk for a little bit. Um, and then jog and then, I don't know, do push-ups or whatever someone may do and say like a CrossFit thing. That's actually jumping between systems all the time and that's uh, uh, fairly interesting but not really what we're talking about at the moment. Um, now there's a couple of things. There is an upward drift in like oxygen uptake whenever we're in like a hot humid environment or whenever we're exercising at a high intensity. So there's a few reasons for this. Uh, and I'm going to show you a graph like on the next slide. It's mostly due to an increased amount of epinephrine, norepinephrine, which are, you know, in England are called adrenaline and noradrenaline. So those are uh, 
like, like really fast acting hormones like fight or flight hormones if you've heard that term before and that essentially will shift us just a little bit into like breaking down ATP just a little bit faster so that we really are starting to shift more towards anaerobic um, in, in those cases. Also increase body temperature. So uh, right here, um, like the upper drift and oxygen uptake during prolonged exercise, and this is if you're maintaining one given level of intensity, like say running seven miles an hour or whatever. If you're in a hot human environment, it will start drifting up a little bit. If you are uh, at a high rate, you'll start drifting up a little bit. It's due to fatigue, also dehydration, losing fluid, sweating, um, all of those things. Really, I just want you to understand like that relationship that over time, it actually gets more intense. So say like right here, whenever you're exercising, it's at, I don't know, 75% uh, of your VO2 max. Then over here, it's going to be a little bit higher, say like 80, 85 percent of your VO2 max, even though you're going the same speed. And that is partially why people conk out or um, cannot uh, uh, maintain a given intensity. So whenever people are out, like say running a marathon, their first couple of miles are at a given pace. Then as they fatigue, they will slow down a little bit in order to maintain an approximately same VO2 max throughout all of it. All right. Okay, so next we need to talk about uh, kind of graded exercise tests and responses to incremental exercise. So what, what I'm talking about here is whenever you, like what we've done in lab, whenever you're exercising at a particular work rate, meaning like cycling with a certain weight on the bike or if you're running on the treadmill at a certain incline. What happens whenever we increase the weight on the bike or whenever we increase the incline? So uh, oxygen uptake increases linearly until maximum oxygen uptake or VO2 max is reached. So VO2 max means that whenever we increase the work rate, we do not consume more oxygen. And w well, I've shown you all this in lab um, uh, uh, at least once where uh, we increase the uh, incline on the treadmill and then their VO2 max didn't go up anymore. And that is indicative of a shifting away from aerobic metabolism in, uh, to anaerobic metabolism and uh, lactate goes up quite a bit at that same time. So VO2 max, main things that we need to know here, it's a physiological ceiling for delivery of oxygen to muscle and it's affected by genetics and training. Typically, through training, we can only alter our VO2 max by around 5 to 15, maybe 20 percent. So it does actually seem to be fairly genetic, um, what someone's VO2 max is. And this is uh, pretty clear from different uh, uh, like research, like twin studies from a guy named Claude Bouchard. Uh, uh, Pretty cool stuff. I, 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 I think I would talk about it more, but I don't want to bore all of you um, on my YouTube channel, so uh, moving on. Um, so there are various physiological factors influencing VO2 max, so it's the maximum ability for the cardiorespiratory system to deliver oxygen to the muscle and the ability of muscles to use the oxygen. So there's a transport side and a utilization side to this equation. and this is the equation that I want everyone to know. It's called the Fick equation, F-I-C-K. And uh, it's from uh, uh, like a German guy back in like the early 1900s, I believe. His, uh, his name was Adolf uh, Fick, uh, a rather unfortunate first name, but a um, uh, uh, fairly uh, smart guy. He was actually trying to figure out an equation to calculate someone's cardiac output, which is notated here as Q or CO, heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. Um, and uh, what he was able to do was measure like the uptake of oxygen and also like, uh, well, just how much oxygen was being uh, consumed. And he was trying to figure out heart rates, uh, not heart rates, um, 
uh, cardiac output because it's hard to measure what's coming out of a left ventricle on a uh, living human. But measuring the differences in oxygen um, pre and post, like going over a muscle, is actually a little bit easier, and he was able to do it. So this is the equation that I want us to know. So VO2 is equal to um, cardiac output, which is heart rate multiplied by stroke volume, multiplied by a VO2 difference, which that's arterial and venous, so red blood, blue blood, right? Oxygen difference, so the uptake, we assume that that is what's uh, taken up going on there, right? All right, so that is the main thing I want you to know from there. Now, this is a graphical representation of VO2 max, so as we increase work rate, and work rate here in Watts, I, I, I know some of us, some of us have issues uh, calculating work rates from uh, bikes and things. Uh, but all I want you to think about this is cycling and increasing the amount of weight on a bike every you know three minutes or so in order to get someone up to their VO2 max. And then uh, essentially we reach a point where it doesn't go up any higher whenever we're measuring it on our metabolic cart and uh, that would be called the VO2 max. And technically, a VO2 max would be whenever someone can actually maintain that for around three minutes. Um, now, if someone is just there momentarily, it's technically called a VO2 peak, but that's really just a research question that I'm not concerned about um, all of you really knowing the difference to. Um, uh, next thing, let's backtrack just a little bit and talk about lactate thresholds. And, uh, uh, well, we've, we've, we've talked about this a fair bit um, in, in lab and, uh, well, I, in, in class already. So the point at which blood, uh, well, here, it's muscle lactic acid rises, blood lactate rises um, uh, systematically during incremental exercise, it typically happens around 50%. And I've actually seen... Um, even lower, 30-40% in very sedentary individuals. Um, so uh, here I just want you to know that it's around 50% for untrained people, like people who don't uh, do aerobic exercise very much. And uh, it happens at higher work rates in trained people who, you know, actually uh, do a bit of, you know, cardio, as they say. Um, it's also called anaerobic threshold. Uh, lactate threshold, anaerobic threshold. Um, it is related to something that we're going to get into in the pulmonary um, uh, chapter, or y you know, the cardiovascular and lung related things. Uh, ventilatory threshold, it's very related to that. Um, so you can almost guess that someone's at their anaerobic threshold the moment that they start to hyperventilate whenever they're exercising. Um, so that's just kind of, uh, uh, if you're ever training people in the future, that's that's a good way to figure that out. Um, and here, onset of blood lactate accumulation, that is whenever we reach four millimoles of lactate in the blood. Already said that, but just know that tidbit of information. Um, already talked about this lactate inflection point. So lactate percent VO2 max, it happens around 50% in untrained, 60, 85, and fairly trained individuals. Um, now there's a couple of explanations for why this is happening, and I, I do like this accelerated glycolysis aspect. That's effectively what I was talking about uh, before. Um, but other explanations are low muscle oxygen, so in, like inability to get enough oxygen to a muscle. I'm, uh, th that certainly does play a role, uh, but I do like this, this one right here, where we have a massive need for ATP, and we have a backlog of uh, like NADHs that we need to get rid of that H so that we can continue doing that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase reaction. That one makes the most sense to me. Um, but, uh, there we go with that. Uh, recruitment of fast twitch muscle fibers. So LDH isozyme and fast f uh, fibers, or, or really skeletal muscle just overall, um, promotes lactic acid formation, whereas the LDH isozyme or different type of lactate dehydrogenase enzyme will 
tend to have lactic acid be converted to pyruvic acid. Uh, also, there's reduced uh, removal of uh, lactate um, from the blood. Uh, various different explanations here. Uh, this one right here uh, explained this quite a bit, like we've got so much glycolysis and we need to get rid of these H's, so we throw them into here and uh, um, effectively so we can continue to get ATP in the energy generation phase of glycolysis. Um, here, uh, uh, just a kind of cool way to, to see what's going on. So lactate threshold, it's related to low muscle glycogen accelerated glycolysis, recruitment of fast twitch muscle fibers, reduced rate of lactate removal. Um, so yeah, yeah, there we go. Uh, now this, um, uh, some practical uses for lactate threshold. In combination with VO2 max, we can uh, figure out um, it, it, well, it's fairly indicative of aerobic performances, uh, especially as races get longer. So um, uh, the mixture of VO2 max and lactate, if I know those two, I can almost in an ordinal fashion tell you who's going to finish the race first to last if I know those three or uh, those two things, meaning the VO2 max and lactate threshold. So uh, um, it's also really good for programming training. And uh, really, if people are interested in losing weight or whatever, uh, um, or if you're ever a trainer working with somebody, um, people typically don't like exercising around their lactate threshold because it hurts. Uh, so if you can figure out where their lactate threshold is and program exercise that is just below that, you might have a uh, better returning rate on people coming uh, to, to train with you, which, you know, is good for trainers who are trying to make money and things, you know. Um, but uh, there, there we go. He, here's somewhat of, um, uh, I don't know, a mathematical explanation of all of this. So here, let's say I have one human, two human, three human. Uh, so three different humans right here. This is all I know about them. I know their VO2 max, so 45, 60, and 70. Now 45 is less than 60, at least in America it is, I think, right? And then 60 and 70, those are, you know, um, uh, different numbers, right? So if this is all I knew about them, in a race of a 5K or longer, I would predict that human three would win this race, and then they would finish in this order. Human three wins, then human two uh, is a silver, human one is bronze. So, you know, if you're not first, you're last, right? If that's all I know. Now, if I know what their lactate thresholds are, let's say I know that um, human one, 45 VO2, 85% lactate threshold, you just multiply that number by 0.85, right, to figure out what amount of oxygen uptake that they could maintain. Um, uh, now human two, 70%, uh, right? And then uh, human uh, three, 50%, like that threshold. All right, now if this is how this looks, right? So this meaning that this is their VO2 whenever they're exercising right at their lactate threshold. So if now I know this information, it changes the order that they finish. Right? So now human three, which we predicted, would come in first. Now comes in third because 50% of 70 is 35, right? So that's all they're able to maintain, right? Not very great. Um, well, I mean, like, it is pretty great. Like, I, if, if I had a 70 uh, VO2 and could maintain 35, uh, uh, I, I, I would be a very happy person. Um, but here, this person who, uh, human one, who is less genetically gifted, they can actually um, uh, uh, maintain a higher uh, like oxygen uptake because their lactate threshold is really high. And human two, uh, this person effectively wins because they have a combination of a fairly high um, VO2 max and um, uh, a fairly high lactate threshold. Now, I guess the reason that I'm telling you this is um, VO2 max is very genetic. I, I said that before. Um, if you want a high VO2 max, you need to pick your parents wisely. Um, 
Now if, uh, well, right, so if you want a high VO2 max, you need to pick your parents wisely, right? For lactate threshold, this is extremely trainable. So if anyone's ever done 400 meter repeats, if you do enough of those, you can really alter where your lactate threshold is. Now, it's probably not gonna make your VO2 max much higher. It, it probably will, just a hair, but this is really what's the most trainable. So, uh, like what's, what's the saying? Um, hard work beats talent whenever talent doesn't work hard. That's, uh, yeah, that's, um, uh, uh, I typically don't like motivational uh, speaking things like that, but it, like it is true in this case that um, individuals who are very gifted that don't train and get their lactate threshold very high, then they really can't maintain a very uh, high output. But in individuals who uh, do train really hard can. All right, that's that, that's kind of the main point I want us to know there. All right, uh, one one big thing that. Um, uh, my old um, biochem teacher, uh, Dr. Gladden, uh, Dr. Lactate, as we all called him. Um, one thing that really grinded his gears was how people talk about um, lactic acid and muscle soreness. So I want everyone to know, lactic acid has absolutely nothing to do with muscle soreness. And the reason for this is lactate production is commonly, well, I mean, like, it, it is commonly believed. I mean, coaches say it all the time. And uh, uh, truthfully, any time I hear someone say, oh, I need to exercise to get the lactic acid out of my muscles because I'm sore, or, uh, like, I'm really feeling the lactic acid in my muscles and they're sore or whatever, um, um, I, I immediately stop listening to them because, well, if, if you get something incorrect like this, then uh, uh, it's unlikely that you know much about exercise um, or just how the body works. So lactate, it's back to baseline after the most hardcore exercise in about an hour. So uh, we were going to have like delayed onset muscle soreness, which that's DOMS, D-O-M-S. Whenever you uh, get sore uh, in about 24 to 48 hours afterward, that's called DOMS, right? Delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, I was going to get uh, everyone really sore in class and then measure your lactate and show you that your lactate was really low whenever you're really sore and just kind of prove to you that it has nothing to do with anything. Um, but uh, like muscle soreness, um, what is causing it? It's not lactic acid. It's actually microscopic injury to muscle fibers, which leads to inflammation. Um, in particular, it's called Z-line streaming. Uh, so here, um, if, if you know what sarcomeres look like, it's, it's about like this, the actinomycin, Z lines, A band, all that type of stuff. That's normally what it looks like. After you do some extreme exercise, particularly muscle lengthening or, um, muscle lengthening or, well, eccentric exercise, that's, that's the term I like. Um, you can really tear up a muscle fiber quite a bit like that. So... That's how that works, effectively, right? Um, so this has nothing to do with lactic acid. Like, there's not a bunch of lactic acid in this damaged muscle versus this control muscle. So uh, that's about all I wanted you to get from that. All right. Um, uh, next couple of things with exercise metabolism. Um, I, I know this always seems to circle back to... Uh, bioenergetics and breakdown of carbohydrates and fats, but that's, I mean, that's really super important for what's going on here. Um, uh, now in lab, we actually measured respiratory exchange ratio. Um, it's frequently called R or RQ, respiratory quotient. Now, when, how, how we measure it, um, the most accurate way is uh, to talk about it is actually respiratory exchange ratio or RER because R or RQ is more at a cellular level um, but that's, that's kind of a nuance that, you know, um, uh, I, I, if you write it incorrectly on tests, I won't hit you hard for it. So, um, from the ratio of carbon dioxide that comes out of your mouth to oxygen that goes into your mouth, I can tell you what you're breaking down for fuel. So uh, RER for palmitic acid, which this is a 16 carbon saturated fat, 
is 0.7. And uh, how that works, just stoichiometry type of stuff, C16, H32, O2, 23 oxygens, 16 carbon dioxide, uh, and then 16 waters. We effectively take the CO2 here and O2 here, and then we do a ratio there, 16 divided by 23. I think it's actually like 0.69, but it's, um, I'm not gonna check that math, and I just want you to know that 0.7 is um, uh, if of an RER means that we're burning 100% fat for fuel, or as close to 100% as we possibly can. Now for carbohydrate, glucose, C6H12O6, we take the outcome of CO2, um, or product, 6CO2 over 6O2, and then we get a one right there. So 0.7 to one. So right here, the main things that I want you to know are uh, this 0.7, 100% fat, 0% carbohydrate, 0.85 is 50-50, and um, one is 100% carbohydrate. Now, something interesting here that I want everyone to know, um, uh, and this is partially because, you know, like I'm a, I'm a keto researcher, or like the Atkins diet, I'm, I'm a fan of it, and I do, you know, like do a fair bit of reading, and I've done a lot of research with it. Um, don't ever say that uh, fat is a more efficient fuel, because it's not. So the kilocalories per liter of oxygen, we actually get more kilocalories per liter of oxygen from carbohydrate than we do fat. And I think that this should make sense just because, let, let's go back a little bit. In, um, in fat, there's not a lot of oxygen in this uh, palmitic acid. So we need to breathe a lot in to break it down. So if we can't breathe a lot, or we can't do things aerobically, then fat is not a good fuel, right? Um, now, for carbohydrate, there is an equal ratio of carbon to oxygen. So that means we don't need to consume as much oxygen to get ATP out of it. So the main thing I want you to understand here is that whenever we're in a pinch, um, whenever we're exercising uh, at a higher intensity, that carbohydrate is a more efficient fuel. And uh, mostly due to it having more oxygen in it, and overall it's just a less complex molecule compared to fats. Fats are really big, um, like it uh, we have to do the whole, like, get it into the cell, like we have to, uh, uh, um, like, have it go through fatty acid translocase, beta oxidation, carnitine palmitate transferase, all these things, right? Carbohydrates, we don't have to do that. Um, it's uh, fairly simple. I, I mean, like, I know the 10 steps in glycolysis. I know no one wants to memorize all of them because, well, I mean, they're hard to memorize. But uh, there's so many more steps in uh, fat breakdown than there are in carbohydrate breakdown. Um, okay, now we're uh, kind of getting around the tail end of uh, this lecture, which um, I'm, I'm sure most of y'all want to anyway. Uh, exercise intensity and fuel selection. So here we go with this. On average, low intensity exercise, meaning below 30% of VO2 max, fats are the primary fuel. As we get more intense, carbohydrates become the primary fuel. So high intensity exercise, we're burning um, more and more carbohydrates the more intense we get. And there is a point where we shift from burning primarily fats to primarily carbohydrates. And this is uh, uh, frequently called the crossover uh, concept. So there's a graph that I want you to see um, uh, I believe it's the next slide. Uh, we'll see if I remember that correctly. Uh, and this really just describes the shift from fat to carbohydrate exercise. Um, so here, for percent of VO2 max, and just see this as exercise intensity. Lower intensities, fat here and teal. Uh, 
highest percent at lower intensities. Carbohydrate, fairly low at um, uh, fairly low at lighter intensities. And as we start exercising harder and harder and harder, we shift from carbohydrate to fat. And this is important because um, we, well, like carbohydrate is a simpler molecule, and also it's more efficient in terms of making uh, ATP. Um, so, or like, you know, like uh, uh, calories overall, we don't have to consume as much oxygen um, as we're uh, like uh, breaking down carbohydrates to get ATP out of it, right? Um, uh, here, I'm, I'm not going to talk about McArdle syndrome. You can look it up. It's actually fairly interesting. Um, like th they have a, um, I don't believe if it's a single nucleotide polymorphism, it might be. It might be like a, a nonsense mutation. I'd, I'd have to look that up. But like a glycogen phosphorylase, how we get ATP um, uh, or, or like get glycogen into the uh, uh, in, into glycolysis, they have a problem with that um, enzyme, meaning that like once they store muscle glycogen, they just can't break it down. Um, uh, uh, fairly interesting. All right. So here's a bit of a question for us. So is low intensity exercise best for burning fat? Now, overall, yes, it is because uh, um, uh, because whenever we're exercising a lower intensity, we're burning almost exclusively fat. Now the issue is whenever we're under a time crunch. And if we're under a time crunch, then the total amount of uh, like calories that we're burning is lower if we're going at a lower intensity versus a higher intensity. So here's, here's a good way how to think about it. Walking versus running. So if we walk a mile, we will burn a higher percentage of fat. And if we run a mile, we're going to burn a lower percentage of fat. But if we uh, walk for 30 minutes, we're going to burn far less calories than if we run for 30 minutes. So effectively, follow this math. This is kind of how this goes. So at like lower intensity exercise, um, higher percentage. Um, so maybe three calories per minute at you know 20 percent of your vo2 max which yields only about two uh, calories of fat oxidation per minute which is relatively low now if we are exercising 60 percent of our vo2 max like a jog we have a lower percent um, uh, of fat burning so about 33 percent so like a, a higher rer number but we burn overall more calories so that that small percentage of more calories actually ends up being more. So uh, there, uh, I, 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 I think that this is uh, fairly interesting. If we have enough time, then exercise at lower intensities, much better at burning fat. But if we're under a time crunch, we actually need to hike up the intensity so that we can burn more fat. And uh, the idea here is called the fat max, so highest rate of fat oxidation. It's typically reached right before the lactate threshold. And here's more or less a pictorial representation of that. Um, over here is the RER, it's notated as R. Over here is fat oxidation. Um, and then here, exercise intensity. So right here, the 60%, that is, you know, around um, the lactate threshold. That's, that's, our fat max right there, meaning that we're burning 0.4 grams of fat per minute, you know, so like that's uh, around, I don't know, like four calories from it or whatever. Um, uh, just do like uh, nine multiplied by 0.4 and then you can figure that out, but uh, I'm not gonna do it. Um, so that, that's really the relationship there, that there is a sweet spot that's, this is another good uh, reason to know someone's lactate threshold because if you want to burn the highest amount of fat 
during the shortest period of time, if you figure out where someone's fat max is and just exercise there, it's right before the lactate threshold, so people, people can typically maintain it for a long period of time, then that's, that's kind of the best way to lose fat overall. Um, all right. Uh, so exercise dura uh, duration and fuel selection. So we're going to talk about, um, uh, well, prior we were talking about um, here, yeah, like we're right around 50 minutes, so like, uh, like uh, take breaks whenever you need to. Um, I, like, I'm, I'm going to finish this slide set. It'll probably go a couple more minutes. Um, so we were talking about exercise intensity prior, so lower intensity, more fat, higher intensity, more carbohydrate. Now we're going to be talking about exercise duration and fuel selection. So prolonged low intensity exercise, there's a shift from carbohydrate towards fat. So the longer we go for exercise, the more fat metabolism. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, so breakdown of triglycerides uh, called lipolysis. Um, that seems to take a little bit of time. And it's, uh, it's fairly related to various hormones, so like cortisol, growth hormone, um, epinephrine, all seem to increase this. Um, uh, so here's really the main picture that I want you to understand, that if we're exercising at one given intensity, say like exercising for, I don't know, five miles an hour, uh, like, like jogging or six miles an hour, wh whatever you want to think, the longer you exercise, the longer the percentage of fat that we break down. So uh, every now and then there's like memes on the internet that say, hey, you're, you don't even burn any fat until you've exercised for 20 minutes. Now that's not true, um, but there's a grain of truth in it, meaning that the longer you exercise, the more fat you will break down. And not just overall, you know, you're burning more calories the longer you exercise, but as a percentage. Um, because it really does just take time to do lipolysis, get fats into a muscle cell, and do the whole beta oxidation thing. It just, it, uh, it, it takes quite a bit longer than carbohydrates are basically right there. So this is the main thing that I want you to understand that the longer you exercise, the greater the percentage of fat, the uh, uh, lower percentage of carbohydrates. So almost going the opposite way of the crossover concept because the crossover concept has to do with exercise intensity. This has to do with exercise duration. Um, now this right here, uh, um, just like how lactic acid uh, causing muscle soreness um, has bothered numerous um, people throughout time and well, like it, it always should, um, this bothers me. Fats burn in the flame of carbohydrates. So I want everyone to cross that out. That is not true. Not true at all. So here's the idea behind it. Within the Krebs cycle, we deplete. These are called Krebs cycle intermediates. So, you know, citrate, isocitrate, alpha ketoglutarate, succinyl CoA, succinate fumarate, malate, oxaloacetate, OAA. The idea is that whenever we're exercising and we don't have enough carbohydrates, and carbohydrates effectively make pyruvate, what we need to do is have more Krebs cycle intermediates because we lose them and effectively the Krebs cycle goes down. So we can't burn um, as, uh, as many calories. And keep in mind that we can only burn fats in the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. That's the only way we can do it. So we need to make more Krebs cycle intermediates from carbohydrates. So typically how this is taught is that pyruvate is converted to axaloacetate through an enzyme called pyruvate carboxylase. Now within muscle, we actually don't even have much of that enzyme. So this whole idea that fat burns in the flame of carbohydrates is true in say like a liver cell, like a hepatocyte or like some other cell, but within a muscle, it actually seems that we make more of these Krebs cycle intermediates 
from amino acids. So what would be more accurate is that fat burns in the flame of oxaloacetate. It seems like this oxaloacetate, this four carbon molecule, is really important for how quickly the Krebs cycle goes. And you know, we get all of our NADHs and that ATP down at the bottom. So it seems like in the skeletal muscle we have a lot of enzymes to convert these amino acids, aspartate asparagine, into oxaloacetate. Um, so that seems to be the main way that this is done. So within a skeletal muscle, it seems like uh, amino acids are actually more important for breakdown of, uh, um, of fat than once thought. And this makes sense, like in our skeletal muscle, that's where we have the most amino acids. You know, like muscles made out of protein and proteins made out of amino acids, right? I mean, I, I think this makes sense. Um, so there, just, just know that, that whenever uh, people tell you that fat burns in the flame of carbohydrate, that means that they, uh, I guess, just weren't taught that uh, pyruvate carboxylase. We don't have a lot of that in, in a muscle, so it's really more about uh, proteins and things. Um, uh, next thing, and we're, uh, I'm going to try to breeze through these slides a little bit faster. Um, uh, send me an email if anything doesn't make sense, or uh, rewatch this or read uh, the textbook. Um, so in terms of fatigue from you know exercise, Carbohydrate feeding via sports drinks or what, however you want to ingest carbohydrates, it seems to improve endurance performance. So we're actually losing muscle, uh, glycogen, and blood carbohydrate um, uh, stores, and that contributes to fatigue. So ingestion of a certain amount of carbohydrates can actually improve performance. Um, so around 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrates uh, seems to be around uh, the upper threshold for like uh, ability to ingestion utilize carbohydrates. Now that's if it's only glucose, um, and we actually have a different transporter for glucose and fructose. So if anybody uh, looks up uh, like Gatorade, how why it has its ratio of like high fructose corn syrup or sucrose or whatever. The idea behind that is we can only absorb so much glucose and we can only absorb so much fructose. So if we put both of them together, we can actually get more carbohydrates into your muscles. Um, so that's kind of cool, right? Uh, um, and actually it goes up to around 90 grams in that case. So if you're doing really long duration exercise, it is a good idea to ingest a combination of glucose and fructose, which I think everyone uh, hopefully remembers that that is sucrose or high fructose corn syrup is, what is that? That's like 55% fructose and 45% glucose. So yeah, um, there also might be some relationship uh, of improving performance and shorter and higher intensity exercises, but that's that's neither here nor there. Um, now, I just kind of wanted to show this. Um, uh, an old researcher uh, named Eddie Coyle, he effectively could predict whenever someone would uh, stop exercising by their blood glucose levels. So he had a group of cyclists um, take a placebo, meaning that uh, they thought they were drinking something that had carbohydrates in it, and the other group actually were consuming something like Gatorade. And down here, this is hours. So if you consume carbohydrates while you exercise at a certain intensity, you can actually last an hour longer than, uh, than people who are not consuming carbohydrates. So I don't know. Like I, I think that that's fairly cool. All right. Um, uh, really quick, just uh, uh, a few more minutes, I promise. So there's different storage sites of carbohydrates and fats that I want everyone to be aware of. So for carbohydrates, two types of carbohydrates that we have. We have muscle glycogen and blood glucose. 
So blood glucose comes from liver glycogen, so those are, we, we only have those. Um, so the difference between those two is muscle glycogen. This is primary, uh, th this is the primary source of fuel during extremely high intensity exercise. And blood glucose is the primary source for lower intensity exercise. So part of the reason for this, if you remember, um, uh, in glycolysis, that sugar trap step, that hexokinase, how we don't have to do that whenever we start from muscle glycogen. So we actually get more ATP out of muscle glycogen than how we do out of blood glucose. So uh, that's, uh, that's fairly interesting. It would make sense. And also, think about it like this. Um, if we are exercising really hard and we need fuel right now, would we get fuel that's right next to us or that we have to get from someplace that's far away from us? So blood glucose, this is effectively maintained by liver glycogen. So the liver, um, its metabolism goes up a little bit whenever we're exercising, but metabolism goes up a lot in muscle whenever we're exercising. So um, whenever we're exercising at a very intense rate, we don't have time to wait for glucose to come from the liver. We need to burn the fuel that we have right next to us. Um, so meaning already within the muscle. Um, now, uh, granted, uh, supplies uh, uh, mostly for the first hour, so we can deplete this a fair bit. Now, blood glucose, um, that, uh, I'm going to tell you some levels um, later on, but uh, that, uh, that typically gets a little bit more depleted during lower intensity exercise. Now for fats, two places where we store fats. So intramuscular, meaning within the muscle, and uh, in fat cells, so uh, plasma-free fatty acids. So that's from fat tissue. Um, and the same song and dance is how this works. So the higher intensity, the more we use fats that are already inside of the muscle, um, and the lower the intensity, the more we use fats that are outside of the muscle. So uh, I, I think that this should make, make some sense. So for exercise intensity, here is overall how I want you to think about it. The lower intensities, we will use fuel that is not inside of the muscle. And the more intense we go, the more we use fuel that is inside the muscle. Now, this is somewhat confusing in here because as we get more intense, we shift away from fats to carbs more. Um, but in terms of how fats are utilized, um, uh, we will use more intramuscular triglycerides for higher intensity exercise versus the fat cell, the plasma-free fatty acids. So kind of two things that I want you to know here. The more intense we exercise, the more carbohydrates we use relative to fats. But also, the more intense we exercise, the more we shift from fuels that are outside the cell, meaning uh, plasma-free fatty acids or glucose. So that's coming from fat cells and liver glycogen to fuel that is inside the muscle, meaning intramuscular triglycerides and muscle glycogen. Um, now, it's just the opposite for duration of exercise. So whenever we're exercising for a longer period of time, we will end up depleting what's inside of the muscle cell and we'll need fuel from outside the muscle cell. So the longer you exercise, the more you're going to become reliant on uh, blood glucose, you know, so from liver glycogen, and also from uh, fats, from fat cells versus fats inside of uh, the muscle. All right. Um, uh, next thing here, just, just a couple of things that I want you to know. Typically, typically, uh, the quantity of uh, carbohydrates uh, that we have, um, liver glycogen, we typically store, I, I want you to know the factor 100 grams of carbohydrate in our liver. So 100 grams of carbohydrate in our liver and around three to 500 or so 
grams of carbohydrate within our muscle. Um, and that's all of our muscles collectively. So the thing that I want you to understand from that is why is a marathon so difficult to run? So if we have 100 grams of carbohydrate within our liver, so 100 multiplied by 4, so uh, 4 grams, uh, uh, 4 kilocalories per gram of carbohydrate. So 100 multiplied by 4. Uh, try to follow me on this. Write this down if you need it. We have 400. Uh, um, oh, shoot, shoot. No, that's 100 times 4. Yes, yes, yes. 400 calories worth of carbohydrates within our liver. And typically, whenever we run a mile, that burns about 100 calories. So we have like four miles. Um, uh, yes, four miles worth of carbohydrates within our liver. Now, 500, uh, or uh, let's just say that we have uh, 500 grams of carbohydrates within our um, uh, uh, muscles. So that yields uh, 2,000 calories, which if we burn 100 calories per um, mile, that's 20 miles worth. So 100 uh, grams of carbohydrates in our liver, um, 500 in our muscles, that works to uh, 2,400 calories. So if anybody knows how long a marathon is, um, a marathon is 26.2 miles, so we actually don't have enough carbohydrates to fuel all of that. That's really why a marathon is so difficult. So uh, that's why it's important to train and get better at burning fat, more or less. Um, but uh, those are the main values that I want you to know. Um, another value, um, the amount of blood or the amount of carbohydrate that we just have circulating in our blood. A lot of people don't know this, so go and write this down. It's typically around um, four to like, uh, I, I mean, five to 10 grams or so. So yeah, it, it it's not very much, uh, um, and, and uh, what is it, a teaspoon of uh, sugar is four grams, give or take. So you have about two teaspoons of sugar in your blood at any given time. So just kind of something interesting to, to know there. Um, now this here, if, uh, if you're interested in Atkins or ketogenic diets, um, uh, some cool research from Jeff Volick actually seems to indicate that after you've been on a low carbohydrate diet for a long enough period of time, that you don't have lower muscle glycogen levels so that's, uh, I don't know, like I, I, I think that that's fairly interesting. Um, uh, next thing and one of the last things, uh, sources of protein during exercise. So proteins broken down into amino acids and branch chain amino acids uh, seem to be the main thing. Um, typically only a small contribution, so around 2%. Now as exercise gets longer, it can increase to 5, 10, or even 15% of energy and mostly what that is is a conversion of um, certain amino acids into glucose and also certain amino acids into intermediates within the Krebs cycle. So there we go with that. Um, here we've already talked about uh, the Cori cycle and lactic acid as a fuel so go and read through those slides and that is really about it. I'll see you in the next lecture.